Hello everyone. I think we might get started. Um, welcome uh, to our fourth and uh, final uh, webinar in the series Business and, Biodi Business and Biodiversity, sorry, that's been brought to you by uh, the Threatened Species Recovery Hub and uh, the Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia. I'm Brendan Wintle. I'm the Director of the Threatened Species Recovery Hub and uh, I'm going to be your MC for the evening, so bear with me. This is a new MCing challenge for me, uh, covering four different types of technology and I'm not really any good at either any of them so uh, this is going to be an adventure um, our seminar our webinar this evening is called mitigating impact and assessing performance tools for business decisions we've got an amazing panel some great speakers so i really hope you're going to enjoy it um, i'd like to start by acknowledging that i'm sitting here on uh, Yatmatung and Dudoroa country in northeast Victoria. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging of this country. I'd also like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging on all of the countries on which we're all joining, from which we're all joining tonight. Um, and I think it's really uh, crucial in this topic that we think about and acknowledge the importance of giving priority to Indigenous custodians when it comes to addressing impacts of uh, doing business on country and opportunities for doing business on country. So um, I hope you'll all uh, join me in uh, welcoming particularly any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. As I said, uh, this is the fourth and last uh, in our webinar series on business and biodiversity. Um, if you've enjoyed the series so far, uh, we do have a new webinar series starting soon uh, with our colleagues uh, at the National Environmental Science Program, Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub. We're gonna be looking at uh, addressing interactions between climate and biodiversity, a really crucial and topical area. We're gonna kick off on the 25th of August uh, with lessons from the fires, a biodiversity and climate perspective perspective on Australia's recent bushfire disasters and what the science can tell us about how to help prepare for future bushfire risk. Um, and you'll see a link to this, uh, to this um, site and uh, to this webinar uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, very soon, soon, hopefully, if our uh, technology is working for us. Okay. Uh, to the audience, uh, we'd really love to hear from you today. We'd like to hear who you are uh, and which, um, which Indigenous country you're uh, coming to us from. So please, if you could go to your chat uh, and you'll find uh, you can, you can uh, send a chat to all panellists and attendees, if you could. Uh, so that's a, a down in the bottom right hand, uh, panel of your screen, you'll find uh, the ability to send a message to all panelists and attendees. Please tell us who you are, what your organisation is, and, uh, and which Indigenous country you're sitting on today. And um, we'd love to hear from you. I'd also uh, like to, while, we're, while you're telling us about where you are and where you're coming from, I'd just like to introduce uh, a couple of our panelists today. Uh, and just hear uh, some preliminary uh, ideas from them. Sorry, one more bit of uh, one more bit of uh, housekeeping before I go into the panelists. Um, we'd like you to be able to pose questions for our panel. So you, throughout the talk, we anticipate quite a lot of questions uh, throughout the webinar. Whether it's individual questions to panelists who've introduced an interesting topic to you, uh, or hot topics that you'd really like to hear about from this panel, we'd love to have your questions now. You don't post those in the chat. You post those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you go down to the bottom of the screen, hit the Q&A box, that's going to open up soon and you can put your questions in there and, we, and we're expecting quite a lot. We will, if you really like the look of somebody else's question, you can like it or upvote it so that it's more likely for us to fit it in and ask it of our panelists uh, during the time. We'll try and get to all of your questions, obviously. For ones that we are unable to get to during this webinar, we'll come back to that in our resources pack and you'll get answers from our panel and our speakers uh, in a resources pack that will come out uh, soon after our, uh, our webinar is complete. 
Okay, before we go to our uh, speakers, we're going to first of all hear uh, a short introduction from some of our panel members. So first to you, Radha. Uh, Radha Kapali is the Managing Director of Investor Services at New Forests. Among other things, she has oversight for integrating responsible investment in environmental, social and governance innovations uh, into the New Forests Investment Strategy. Radha, can you please tell us uh, a little bit about New Forests, uh, your work, and what you think the key challenges are uh, in at the moment uh, from the perspective of investors and businesses around uh, at the topics that we're covering tonight? Well, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for um, the opportunity to speak with all of you. Um, so New Forests is a sustainable forestry funds management business. Um, we have about six and a half billion Australian dollars uh, under management and assets across Australia, New Zealand, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Laos, uh, and the United States. So we're managing forestry assets primarily for sustainable um, timberland revenues, but also looking at um, emerging environmental markets, for carbon, biodiversity, and water. And our you know, management approach or um, investment philosophy is around sustainable landscapes. So seeking to balance conservation and production and landscapes to generate um, shared value for uh, the communities where we operate. Um, so most of our clients are uh, institutional investors. These are you know, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds who are, have long-term uh, investments or investment horizons. So climate change is certainly on the agenda of most of the kinds of clients that we're dealing with across Australia, Europe, uh, North America. But I you know, firmly believe that um, you know, biodiversity is increasingly uh, in the near term horizon um, as a topic for institutional investors. And I'm even hearing some of our clients starting to say that they're seeking to develop a biodiversity policy the same way that they have climate policies. So from our perspective as a company, I mean, we are, um, you know, zero deforestation, you know, we're seeking to not create any net negative uh, impacts on the land that we're generating, but all net positive uh, environmental and social impacts. So I think there's kind of three key questions that we think about when it comes to biodiversity. Um, the first, you know, what are the opportunities that we have in the landscapes that we're, we're operating in to, um, to enhance biodiversity outcomes? You know, secondly, um, how do we report and measure uh, on biodiversity outcomes to our, our clients? And three, you know, how can we link positive uh, biodiversity outcomes to, you know, improve valuations and, and better economic returns? So, you know, just briefly, um, you know, what are we doing? Um, so we have, you know, conservation, habitat restoration, and uh, improvement programs on the majority um, of the assets that we have globally. So, for example, here in Australia, we have large landscapes where we have, you know, pine plantations and eucalyptus plantations, but they're completely integrated with um, you know, broader uh, landscape uh, uh, objectives. Um, we have some um, experimentation around natural capital uh, accounting. So I'm happy to talk about more of those examples during the discussion. Um, and what ultimately like we'd like to do is, you know, strive towards uh, standardized impact metrics. You know, that's ultimately what our clients are trying to look at. You know, how do we compare different investment managers and investment strategies? And that's been pretty difficult. Um, in biodiversity, you know, what we have done so far is looked at um, reporting on management of high conservation value areas or trying to report on the types of restoration and protection activities, but getting towards uh, more complex metrics and indices is, I think, you know, probably the, the next, next generation of what we're trying to do. Um, and really look forward to hearing more, uh, I think, about that. And ultimately, if we can get to on, on climate, get to biodiversity where we are in climate, I think that'll be a huge step forward. And then finally is thinking about, you know, what are the mechanisms to link uh, to value? Um, uh, how do we convince valuation firms that, um, you know, uh, high value, high ecosystem services, um, uh, natural vegetation is worth more uh, than, you know, low value or not well-maintained uh, natural vegetation. Um, and what does that mean for the productive landscapes? And then, of course, even things like offset programs, you know, take it um, uh, that much step further. Um, so anyways, this is a very important area um, of conversation. And I think, uh, you know, probably the next critical stage, I think, from an investment perspective. 
Great, thanks, Rada. Um, some really fascinating points there. You sort of uh, draw a loop back to our first uh, webinar where we were we were all sort of talking about uh, the desire to bring biodiversity sort of up to the profile of climate mm. uh, in the in the view of businesses. Uh, and so, I think this is a really nice um, a nice uh, rounding out of that of the themes that we developed in that. Um, now to you, David. Uh, David Francis is Senior Principal of Colleges at Cardno. Uh, Cardno is a global infrastructure, environmental and social development company. He's been operating in more than 100 countries. He has over 27 years of experience uh, in delivering projects for government, the development sector, extractive industries and government organisations in East Australia and PNG. David, um, can you tell us a bit about what you do, um, what you see from your perspective and at Cardno, the key challenges in addressing uh, biodiversity impacts or opportunities in business? Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, hi from Turrbal country in Brisbane. Um, challenges. Uh, I started scratching down some notes before today just to uh, think what some of the, the challenges were. And it was only just before, just, just when we was kicking off before, I hastily scribbled one, uh, scribbled one out and added another. Uh, what I find, um, with some of my clients, I work a bit with the development sector, so land developers, uh, extractive resources, and the like, as we said before. Um, what I find is a lot of my clients actually want to do the right thing. Um, they're just often looking for certainty. Um, there's a, there's a um, find that the legislative frameworks tend to be fairly dynamic um, and uh, mapping changes constantly, laws changes constantly, expectations change constantly. Sometimes with good reason, sometimes uh, without, um, but to assist business in making good decisions, they need a bit of certainty in moving forward. Um, but when we do uh, head off on the right path uh, and we do start to measure uh, impacts on biodiversity, often my clients, which may be um, either people who are creating impacts or people who are actually um, regulating um, impacts, government and, and the like, um, they want to know whether the approach they have adopted is correct um, because there's so many um, uh, tools, uh, metrics, uh, conditions of approval out there nowadays. Um, it's very hard to determine which ones actually uh, successfully and accurately measure impacts on biodiversity. Um, so they're probably the two, two main things I'd like to share. Yeah. Great, thanks, thanks, David. Well, I'm sure you'll um, sure we'll get round to uh, the uh, impending changes to our national environment legislation at some point there, and it'll be great to hear uh, hear your perspectives on that. Um, I'm going to move now to uh, Sissy Sissy Gore Birch. Sissy has uh, Yaru heritage through her grandmother's country, is connected to Nakinya and uh, Balangara country. She's chair of our hubs, uh, Indigenous Reference Group. We're very lucky to have um, Sissy in charge of our group there. She also has current leadership roles that span Bush Heritage, um, recently NAILSMA, uh, the Threatened Species Scientific Committee, um, another Northern uh, Australian Nest Pub, and, and it's a very long list. I won't go into the, the full list now, but Sissy, thanks so much for joining us. Can you um, Please tell us from your perspective as an Indigenous leader and across your many roles, what you think some of the critical issues are for businesses um, conducting themselves and assessing uh, their biodiversity impacts on country in relationship with cultural heritage values and indeed opportunities for business on country if you want to go there as well. Uh, thanks, uh, Brendan, and um, thanks to the other guest speakers this morning. And I just want to acknowledge that I am currently sitting on Murrungadjurung country. So I'm based up in Kananara in Western Australia, up in the very top end of the, uh, the Kimberley, especially the East Kimberley. And uh, just with the introduction, um, I am a Balangara, uh, brought up in Balangara country and I've always been passionate about um, country, land, economic development, employment opportunities for indigenous people, and especially looking at I guess capturing the voices of Indigenous people and meaningful uh, conversations with genuine partners throughout and making sure that the voices of Indigenous people are being heard at the table. So I guess some of, that's some of the biggest challenges is um, I guess getting Aboriginal people at the table 
um, at the very beginning and through to the end. And um, especially when we're talking about business, when we're talking about biodiversity, and when you consider that Aboriginal land and looking at native title, um, Aboriginal people, um, the, there are large portions of country in Australia that is um, directly managed by Aboriginal people. So it's really important to have the uh, traditional owners at the table when we're talking about decisions around business and especially when we're talking about the importance and looking at the impacts of um, biodiversity on country. So really yeah. looking forward to the discussion and if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to um, answer them throughout and uh, looking forward to hearing from others. Brilliant. Thanks, Sissy. Um, it's great to have you. Um, thanks again for joining us um, from the other side of our big country. Um, I'm going to now move to Prue Addison. Prue is uh, Conservation Strategy Director, um, Burks, Bucks and Oxon Wildlife Trust and Research Associate at the University of Oxford, collaborating on research relating to corporate biodiversity accounting and conservation finance. Prue, from your experience working with businesses in this space, what do you think the most critical or challenging issues are that you see for businesses seeking to assess biodiversity impacts or measure their, um, the benefits of their activities? Thanks, Brendan. And hi, everyone. Um, good morning from Oxford. Um, so for the last four and a half years, I've been working in the UK on corporate biodiversity accountability. And one of the topics that really has been discussed most with me when I meet with businesses is specifically around metrics or indicators, exactly like what Rada mentioned. People are asking me all the time, is there something off the shelf that I can use? Is, and their preference is always for a single indicator, the tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent um, for biodiversity. But I'm afraid my answer to these questions is just not as simple as some people may hope. Um, and we definitely don't have a universally agreed biodiversity metric to help businesses get that certainty to measure their performance. Um, and the truth is that we may ne never get to that single biodiversity metric, but that doesn't mean that we've not got biodiversity metrics and indicators. We're actually swimming in them. Um, and they're designed for all sorts of purposes. So when we think about scales of business operations, there are biodiversity indicators for site level operations, supply chains, products, regional operations, all the way through to corporate operations. And so these scales are really important for us to distinguish um, early on to ensure that th when we start to talk about indicators with businesses, that those indicators will actually be fit for purpose for what they need to make inform their decisions and help assess their biodiversity performance. So um, just a few weeks ago, uh, I had a, a paper that was published in the Journal of Business Strategy and the Environment um, with a great team of co-authors. And in this paper, we called it Bringing Sustainability to Life. We present a framework to help actually support more comprehensive development of biodiversity indicators for a range of business contexts. So we, while we don't provide that sing, silver bullet of a biodiversity indicator for all businesses, um, what we do provide is a framework that can help them all work through a process to actually get to a set of indicators or a single indicator that meets their, uh, their needs. And so this paper joins a really rapidly growing body of work that's coming out of the UK and the EU at the moment, which is seeing a flurry of biodiversity indicators being developed for different business contexts. Um, so I'll leave it there um, and I look forward to contributing to the discussion later and maybe I can bring some of these initiatives in that might be relevant. Brilliant. Thanks, Pru. That's a great overview and congratulations on resisting the, um, the push to try and boil our complexity and our nature down to one uh, indicator. What a horrible thought. And uh, Congratulations also for not uh, relenting to that posh Oxford accent that I was uh, <laughs> I was fearing you might bring to the meeting today. Great to My hear. My accent has not changed. Um, <laughs> not at all. Thanks, Prue. All right. Um, we're going to get uh, into our uh, speaker program now. Um, we're very fortunate to have Martine Marin, uh, who's going to uh, launch our, uh, our full talks uh, today, Martine's a professor in environmental management and also an IRC future fellow at the University of Queensland. She's deputy director of the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. She's a key leader in offset policy research nationally and internationally. And uh, thank, 
thanks uh, so much, Martin, for uh, stepping up to uh, talk us through this important work. I might, before you kick off, just um, remind the audience that the Q&A function is there at the bottom of your screen, uh, a little to the right of centre. Uh, if you want to ask a question of any of our panellists or any of our speakers, please do, please do go ahead or go in there and upvote questions you like the look of. Take it away, Martine. Thanks so much, Brendan, and thanks to the panel too. That was a fantastic um, start, and I'm really excited to see all the people who um, are joining in. I could see um, people from all over the world in the chat, and it's great to be joining you from Yago country in southeast Queensland. Um, I'm not going to start with anything very cheerful, of course, because we never do. Um, we know that biodiversity is not doing so well, and I think that Brendan did the best job of getting us all very depressed about this in the first uh, webinar in this series, if anyone wants to go and, and watch that. It was a, a really clear sort of description of, of the challenge that we're facing. But just a very brief recap, and I promise to finish on a more positive note. So the IPBES Global Assessment Report that was released last year, it, it basically essentially painted a picture of one species, us, um, appropriating around about 75% of um, the Earth's land. Um, that doesn't leave a lot of room for everything else that we're meant to be sharing this planet with. I think one of the most striking sort of factoids that brings this home for me is, is the fact that of all the wild, uh, sorry, of all the mammals on the planet, 96% of them by biomass is us and our livestock. That's only 4% of the biomass of the planet's mammals left for all of the other wild species. It's pretty shocking. And so unsurprisingly, because of all of this, um, we're losing our, our co-inhabitants, our wildlife. They're becoming extinct at a rapid rate at an increasing rate and a further 1 million species is estimated to be threatened with extinction. So the IPBES report really called on us to change our ways, to change our ways fast or we risk losing our life support system because we rely on the natural world and all that it's doing for us. And infrastructure and industrial development that directly and indirectly uh, causes the, the transformation and the loss of natural habitats um, are among the most important drivers um, of these losses and changes. And they're one of the drivers over which um, we hypothetically have quite direct control. We make an active decision to convert an area of land or not. But of course, there's also an incredibly strong imperative to um, develop further and we're amid a global infrastructure boom. And of course, um, achieving the sustainable development goals is gonna rely on a lot of development of infra infrastructure and industry, and some of which is inevitably going to conflict with biodiversity conservation. So how do we manage this reality? Well, 2020 is a huge year for grappling with this exact problem, both in Australia and globally. Um, parts of a draft global biodiversity framework have been negotiated under the Convention on Biological Diversity have been released. And in Australia, of course, we have, as Brendan mentioned, the EPBC Act statutory 10 year review. And the interim report was released um, last month. And both of these documents um, grapple with these um, competing imperatives, um, often competing imperatives of biodiversity conservation and development, using this concept of no net loss. So the zero draft of the global biodiversity framework included this goal of no net loss of ecosystem extent and integrity. And the interim EPBC Act review prototype national standards included outcomes of uh, no net loss and net gain for uh, threatened species and ecosystems. And businesses thinking in the same sort of way, um, looking at how to apply the same level of ambition to its activities. So for example, BP recently launched its new biodiversity commitment, which includes the aim to achieve a net positive impact on biodiversity. And um, um, Rada was just talking about this before um, from the new forest, forest perspective. So it's an increasingly popular way of framing the way out of this um, challenge that we have. So what are net outcomes? You know, what is no net loss? Um, 
there is a simple answer to that question and then there is a more complex answer which is probably a more correct answer and i have only got time to talk about the simple answer to that question today but i'm hoping that jeremy simmons who's speaking next will talk a little bit more about the complex one but basically no net loss differs from just no loss um, in accepting that some avoidable losses are going to occur so long as they are counterbalanced by equivalent gains and achieving this at the project level is guided by the mitigation hierarchy, which I know that many of you are going to be very familiar with. But in summary, the idea is to first avoid impacts altogether, such as by relocating um, a, a project's footprint or, or part of it. And then um, room for remaining impacts, the next step is to take measures that, to minimise those as much as possible. Now, avoidance and minimization are really essential and should dominate the process. And the reason for that is because the next two steps are really risky and they're not always possible. So they are first to remediate the damage um, that, that might be caused to biodiversity. And then finally, to offset or compensate for any residual impacts that remain. And so that sounds fantastic but the problem is that um, the evidence of the success of implementation of this approach has been really mixed so it's, it's often really hard to find solid evidence that that of the kind that you need to evaluate the net outcomes of projects let alone to evaluate net outcomes at a regional or, or larger scale but where those evaluations have actually been done they've overwhelmingly found um, a failure to achieve a no net loss standard and there are many, many different reasons for this. Um, often um, there's strong guidance on principles, but their translation to policy often leaves a lot to be desired. And the implementation itself is often not best practice. Um, there are good reasons for this. Recreating nature, it's just not easy. It's slow and it's expensive. And this fact should drive more avoidance, but often it actually ends up driving relaxation of the strict standard that offsets should be um, requiring. And so this um, poor implementation of the mitigation hierarchy presents considerable risk to business, both reputational risk and risk of legal challenge. So ongoing improvement, um, evaluation of performance and provision of tools and guidance around the mitigation hierarchy and its implementation is really crucial. And until recently, um, the Business and Biodiversity Offsets Program did a lot of really, really important work in this space and the really fantastic resources that it created, you can access at this link here and I'll make sure I share that in the resources pack. Um, but Bebop is no longer operating. Um, and at the Threatened Species Recovery Hub, we're also um, developing guidance around many of the issues um, where the performance of um, mitigation and offsetting falls, falls, tends to fall down. Um, and we've also done a lot of work through a recent um, a working group supported by the SNAP partnership. Um, um, and so we've developed a series of um, information sources, uh, explainer videos, tools and guidance, and we're going to make these available online to help guide better decisions around biodiversity offsetting. But these projects will also be wrapping up. So we can see that the need for this sort of work and guidance is really ongoing. So we proposed um, to the IECN um, a new thematic group under their Commission on Ecosystem Management and we're calling it the Impact Mitigation and Ecological Compensation Group, largely because we wanted a much easier acronym than the IPBES one. So IMEC aims to continue to review and refine and disseminate guidance around implementation, in particular, of the mitigation hierarchy and ecological compensation. And we see this as a really important opportunity to build on the foundations of initiatives like the Business and Biodiversity Offsets Program and also IUCN's work on biodiversity offsetting policy to really try to maintain that momentum in um, improving implementation. And a particular focus is going to be on better linking our um, biodiversity conservation targets, such as, for example, those that might be set under Australia's national standards or under the CBD with compensation requirements so that businesses can say that the outcomes from, from their enterprise, from their project align with those, um, with those targets. So this group aims to share resources, to run webinars, and to connect practitioners and policymakers right across the globe. 
Um, the IMAC um, group is going to be, it's open to membership uh, for any member of the Commission on Ecosystem Management. And you can apply to join the Commission as an individual on the Commission's portal. And the link is just at the bottom of the screen. We really would welcome um, new members. We're keen to have members who bring a range of experience from across multiple sectors, as well as ensuring diversity across um, geographical regions and across cultures. So if you're interested, please check out the thematic group webpage and um, consider joining the group and we'll send the details around in the resources pack. Thanks very much. Thanks, Martine. Um, really fabulous uh, summary and uh, amazing initiative uh, to set up your own IUCN group there to provide those resources that uh, businesses are, uh, are clearly crying out for in immense demand. So, uh, yeah, amazing stuff. Uh, I won't, uh, we, we won't dwell now with questions. We'll move on to our next speaker and uh, we'll come back to questions for our panellists and our speakers at the end. So um, now uh, I'm going to move on to Jeremy Simmons. Jeremy is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Queensland. He's looking at biodiversity impact assessments uh, and how contentious, the contentious tool of biodiversity offsetting can be harnessed to deliver better environmental outcomes. Jeremy, take it away. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Martine, for the excellent opening presentation. Uh, and thanks to everybody for joining this afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be joining you from the, uh, the country of the Turbul people in Northern Brisbane. I'm going to uh, be digging into uh, a topic that Martine has given us a really great overview of just now, biodiversity offsetting. Like Martine, I'm going to be starting uh, on a bit of a gloomy note, but I'm hoping that uh, in five or six minutes, you'll start to see a little bit of light on this gloomy horizon. So this is a quote that I wanted to start with. Environmental offsets often poorly designed and implemented, delivering an overall net loss for the environment. Um, this clearly is um, counter or contrary to the premise on which offsetting is based, as Martin has just explained to us, this idea of achieving no net loss. This is a really powerful quote and it's a headline finding um, in the recently released interim report of um, Australia's national environmental legislation, the EPBC Act. So uh, this is current, this is two weeks old, this report and this finding. So in the here and now, the status quo is that offsetting is really failing to deliver on its promise. Let's have a quick look at why that's the case. Here we have a, a hypothetical landscape, which is primarily forested, uh, but there's some mixed use here, some agricultural land use. We have a big infrastructure project that comes through power lines and that corridor results in the loss of a whole bunch of forest and that triggers an offset requirement. Now how that's usually done in Australia and in many other places around the world is by, let's say, finding a patch of forest in the adjacent landscape, uh, removing the, the cattle in this instance, putting a fence around it and protecting it from future loss. Removing cattle might uh, result in some uh, small increases in the condition, but primarily this is about keeping that existing biodiversity into the future. What's really clear from this hypothetical example is that the net outcome of this scenario is one of loss. We have less forest in this landscape uh, as a result of this power line project and it's offset. Uh, because of this um, premise of uh, protecting existing biodiversity, this is really inconsistent with conservation targets that aim to halt and reverse declines in biodiversity. <clears throat> Martin touched on this concept of conservation or biodiversity targets. As Martin said, this year is a really big year here in Australia and abroad. We've got the Convention on Biological Diversity post-2020 framework on the horizon currently being deliberated upon. We know that outcomes-based targets for biodiversity are likely to be a central uh, premise of the convention to which nations of the world will be signing up to. We know in the interim report of the EPBC Act that a major recommendation is for the establishment of national environmental standards upon which to frame all sorts of decisions around matters of national environmental significance. The concept of 
targets for biodiversity um, represents, I guess, uh, an opportunity to redress some of the issues that are plaguing offsetting as currently designed and practiced. And I'll step through this slide in a little bit of detail because targets give us something to aim for when it comes to practices like offsetting or ecological compensation. I hope you can see my mouse moving. Uh, Brendan, can you give us a thumbs up if, that, if that's clear on the screen? It doesn't really matter if it's not. I'm just going to start in the top here. So if we've got a biodiversity feature for which a target has been set and that biodiversity feature, so this might be an ecosystem or a particular species, is below that target, then it's implicit that in order to achieve that target, there needs to be an increase in that biodiversity. And the trajectory required for that is one of net gain, touching on the net outcomes that Martin previously described. As we move down, if a biodiversity feature is approximately at its target, then what we need is a true no net loss. That means that for every um, unit of loss of that particular biodiversity feature, it needs to be counterbalanced with a gain in that feature. There are some probably rare circumstances where uh, a particular biodiversity feature like a, a a broadly distributed and non-threatened ecosystem may be able to be drawn down a little bit uh, and that can be in a managed way. But what I really want to highlight here is these two um, topmost trajectories. We can't get away with um, protecting existing biodiversity as in the averted loss example that I showed earlier uh, and expect to uh, have a trajectory of net gain or, or true no net loss. We need to undertake these improvement actions, restoration, uh, rehabilitating sites, enhancing species populations through direct actions on the ground. As Martin noted, this is hard, but this is what we need to do if we're going to be, um, to use the vernacular, fair income about real gains in biodiversity. Okay, so the, I guess maybe the question you might be wondering here is, so what? How is this really different from the status quo? Or how is this an improvement? This concept I'm describing here is uh, something that's been worked up by a big group of people here in Australia and abroad, a, a large international collaboration. We call it target-based ecological compensation. It's basically taking this idea of outcomes-based targets for biodiversity, linking ecological compensation to the achievement of those targets. And the great benefit of it that we see is that it really makes it uh, that much simpler and clearer to answer these key questions that I guess are really um, fundamental for practitioners operating in this space. For a particular loss, how much compensation is required and what type. This target-based approach allows for those questions to be answered in a simple and transparent way uh, through a couple of really simple mathematical formulas that can be plugged into uh, a, a really straightforward Excel spreadsheet. So we're getting away, we're starting to strip, strip away that complexity. We're designing this to achieve real desirable outcomes. And I suppose as David said in his opening um, uh, speech there about certainty, this approach embeds a bit more certainty in this process, which is lacking in a lot of instances. <clears throat> Just to return to our hypothetical landscape here and demonstrate this concept. This bird is the Regent honey eater. It's a critically endangered species of southeastern Australia. Let's say the Australian government has a commitment to uh, double the habitat extent of this bird compared to what we have now. So the target is to, is to increase it by um, 200%. Here come the power lines. We've lost some Regent honey eater habitat. Under this target-based approach, uh, to be consistent, with contributing to the achievement of the target for this critically endangered species, it's not enough to protect that patch of bush to the west. What's needed is to do some uh, real on the ground habitat restoration work. And the amount that's required is two units of uh, restored habitat for every unit that you've lost. In that uh, scenario, the project has uh, resulted in a net outcome of twice as much habitat compared to before the project, which is entirely consistent with the overarching Australian government commitment of doubling habitat extent for this bird. Offsetting ecological compensation is highly contentious. Again, as Martin uh, indicated, it's, it's really complicated. 
It's beset by an enormous range of implementation and governance challenges. And there's a huge amount of work still to be done there and, and, and really uh, important obstacles to overcome. But it's also ubiquitous. It's very widespread. I want to draw your attention to the countries in green and orange and pink on this map. This map is produced by the IUCN and the Biodiversity Consultancy uh, and the University of Kent. Those countries in green and orange and pink are some way down the line of establishing some sort of offsets or compensation policy, be it in an earlier exploratory way, all the way through to a fully embedded and implemented policy. It's very widespread and so opportunities to uh, harness its power and, and the contributions that business can make to these uh, Biodiversity targets, which are only going to become more prominent, is, is a really, I believe, uh, important opportunity. So to summarise on this concept of target-based ecological compensation, it really, we believe, clarifies the division of responsibility among actors, be that business who are compelled to provide compensation, governments who are setting the rules, and other actors. As I've described, it simplifies the determination of compensation requirements. For one thing, it um, dispenses with the really complicated and fraught world of counterfactual assumptions and scenarios. And we think that it really can help business to align their activities towards contributions to uh, good, desirable outcomes for biodiversity. Uh, I focused in these examples on um, threatened species. Uh, but biodiversity targets can cover all manner of um, elements, be that uh, biodiversity of uh, importance for ecosystem function or ecological function, biodiversity of importance for cultural heritage reasons. So it, we think this approach has a broad uh, scope. There's a lot of work to be done. I'd really, or we'd really welcome suggestions, feedback, thoughts. Uh, again, thank you for having us today and giving us this opportunity to speak and Acknowledgement to a huge number of organisations uh, who have contributed to the development of these ideas. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Um, really thought provoking uh, talk. I'm sure it's going to uh, generate a little bit of chat in the Q um, and A, uh, and and as, as offsets often does, uh, even even with our uh, even with our reviewer of the EPBC at Graham Samuel always creates some strong feelings uh, whenever you talk about offsets. So thanks uh, for that really thought provoking presentation. Our next speaker is Guy Dudson. Guy is the Senior Principal Consultant at the Biodiversity Consultancy. He advises on projects and for companies on how to audit and monitor biodiversity for least impact and to inform adaptive management. Um, while Guy is speaking, uh, can you continue to post uh, and upvote questions in the Q&A uh, so that we'll have the opportunity to put your curly questions to our uh, talented speakers and panellists. Take it away, Guy. Thank you, Brendan. Um, hello, everyone from Wadawan country where it's very cold and wet and I'm happy to be inside. I'm gonna try to give a, a bigger picture overview about biodiversity metrics from the perspective of businesses about uh, businesses who want to know why and particularly how they should be measuring biodiversity. The reasons why businesses want to measure biodiversity can be boiled down to some relatively standard drivers. We've got regulatory requirements, um, legal requirements, policy requirements um, in place around biodiversity in most nations. There's an increasing driver around lender requirements. So the finances um, are increasingly looking at, about their due diligence. Um, and we've definitely got increasing stakeholder expectations around, um, around businesses. So, so yeah, I was talking about these different um, drivers. Um, th th in particular, there's an increasing um, driver around meeting global targets. So the equivalent of the Paris Accord of trying to meet 1.5 degrees. Um, we haven't really worked out a biodiversity target. People have proposed something like 30% of the world by 2030, but these science-based targets are increasingly um, feeding down as a driver um, to corporate uh, measurement of biodiversity. The, um, the businesses who want to measure um, need to demonstrate their progress. Um, they, 
they need to mitigate impacts and and not just mitigating the impacts but monitoring and auditing and demonstrating and, and really adaptively managing those impacts and there's an increasing interest in life cycle analysis uh, next slide please so the barriers to measuring biodiversity. Um, we, we, unfortunately, there are some, some really quite inherent barriers to why this hasn't been mainstreamed so far. Uh, top of the list is the fact that biodiversity is intrinsically complex. Um, for carbon, we, we have a simple single metric of tons of CO2 equivalent. We can't do that with biodiversity. As Brendan said, we, uh, we can't and we won't and unfortunately that means that there are going to have to be different measures. Um, a lot of these measures are based on data and there's a lot of gaps in our um, data availability uh, so we can use models which have patchy data or we can go and collect data which which is expensive. Um, lots of users in particular in the business world are, are not very used to these um, concepts to the to the tools and metrics or um, or even the, the objectives and perhaps most importantly there's there's different business needs um, so different business needs require different tools and different metrics and then we've got to communicate all of this out there to an audience so the next slide, it shows a confusing list of indicators and frameworks. Um, these are just a few I pulled out in a few minutes of looking and all of those are competing for space. And, and in many ways, each of those is a perfectly valid way of measuring biodiversity, but the user has to know which of those to choose and it's a bit daunting and confusing. So onto the next slide, we're looking at um, what metric can we choose? And in many ways, it's a trade-off between um, those three dimensions of validity. So we want our metric to be accurate and precise. Uh, feasibility, so, so we want the metric to be relatively affordable and, and quick to undertake. And completeness, so we want the metric really to recover all of the measures of biodiversity which are relevant and important um, to the application. Increasingly, we're adding another dimension onto that, which is whether these metrics are scalable or not. Can we compare across sectors, across businesses, um, across geographies and jurisdictions? Can we aggregate up um, so that the, the metric from a project can be combined across projects into a program up to a corporate or to a jurisdiction and then up globally um, to things like the CBD. And then similarly, can we allocate down? So um, can we have something like our Paris 1.5 degrees target or our 30% by 2030? And can we allocate that back down to jurisdictions and, and to businesses in terms of society's expectation for their biodiversity um, impacts and uh, positive and negative. So, so the, yeah, the take home message from this is that where there are different needs, we need different measurements. Um, if, if there's some examples there of where different approaches fit in that triangle, um, in, in that trade off. But up onto the next slide which is to talk a little bit more about scalable metrics, the metrics that we're using now, and to make a first attempt to try to simplify that long daunting list of metrics into some, some logical sense. Most of the metrics we're looking at are looking at ecosystems, so in that um, top left box, and there's an, an, a real convergence around the need to have a metric that combines the extent or the area with the condition or the quality, and also to add something about significance. Um, biodiversity impact metric is an example of that that has been promoted by um, WCMC and others. Underneath, we've got some species metrics. Um, so if we're looking specifically at individual species, um, then we need to have a, a metric for those. And um, as recently researched and published by Brendan, 
um, often we can't assume that the ecosystem necessarily holds the species and we might need to be measuring both of these together. So, so there's one metric under development called the star metric for that. The ecosystem metrics back at the top, they feed across into life cycle assessment. Um, so I think Heather's helping with the slides. If we just advance one tab on this, between ecosystem metrics and the life cycle assessment, we're using a model for the condition score. Um, and three of the models are commonly used are mean species abundance, biodiversity, intactness index, and potentially disappeared fraction. Those are all models, lots of mass and layers behind them, and they would feed into a life cycle assessment. And to undertake the life cycle assessment, a business needs to take up a, a model such as the XEO base input output model and the, the impacts and, uh, on biodiversity need to have a specific model such as recipe or Globio. Um, and, and those can be input into a larger life cycle assessment. So a couple of examples there are the global biodiversity score or the biodiversity footprint models. On to my first example, um, just to give a few case examples to try and make this, this real and to, and really to demonstrate that <clears throat> in reality, business often has to go for this, for the feasible, for something that, that's practical. So an extractive company, <clears throat> which I work for, wanted to demonstrate their progress to net positive impact um, for biodiversity at a corporate level. They wanted some simple, clear metrics based to measure that progress and to communicate it to a wider audience. And they um, used a metric of quality hectares. So that's a, a, a simpler version of um, habitat hectares or the metrics that are often used in biodiversity offsetting in Australia. So, so that they often just used a simple five point scale, as you can see here. That worked well in many ways, but the metric was, in, in some ways too simple. Um, a lot of stakeholders weren't very confident that it was adequately um, valid and complete. Um, it, it wasn't precise enough to show small gains in, um, for instance, uh, restoration offsets. Um, and, and there was no real ability to enable trading between different ecosystems. It hadn't got a significant score in it. So we had a few niggling problems with that metric. But in this case, the, the issue wasn't the metric, the issue was the bigger picture framing that the company, although it had made a commitment to net positive impact, it, it hadn't adequately demonstrated the business case for that across its own business. So it, it, it lost the internal business driver and support um, to see this through. Um, so, so we didn't get to improve these metrics. Example number two is coming back to something much simpler. Um, a real estate company was looking at uh, Walmart, the huge US retailer, and they've got a, a program where they compensate a hectare that they impact with a hectare of conservation area. So that orange box. And, and we suggested to them, that's fine, let's start simple. But if we add in two other components, a, um, a condition component and a significance component, we can just leave those at a default value of one to start off with while this company um, gains some familiarity with the concept and really builds its own internal business case around it. And then we can improve improve the complexity of that um, as and when the company has the internal confidence to go a bit further. So, so a metric such as this, it, it's not going to deliver no net loss. It's not um, hugely science-based, but it's ahead of the sector. It's a big step forward and it's got the potential to, to really um, th th improve the, the, um, the science in there. And the third example I want to give is the use of life cycle analysis. So ASN Bank used life cycle analysis specifically to look at the biodiversity footprint of their investments. They used the XEO base model, the recipe um, layers, and uh, the condition metric was the PDF, the potentially disappeared fraction. They've got some nice bars. Those orange bars show the um, biodiversity impact. Um, and so they can look across their portfolio 
and see that the biodiversity impact across their investment portfolio is much higher in some sectors and other sectors. Our conclusion from this is that that gives a reasonable sort of order of magnitude relative score and you can compare relative values, but I really wouldn't read anything into the precise numerical values. Um, and, a, and a real lesson from this is that the, the quality of the data we get out really is dependent on the data that goes in and the LCA analyses, they rely so much on black box formulae and GIS layers that it can be really difficult to know what the quality of the data inside there is. And we really need some, some expert interpretation of, of what those data layers are like and, and what the biases are um, before we take the outputs at face value. So just some key messages for me. There's a, a strengthening business case to measure biodiversity. Um, the perfect metric, the tons of CO2 equivalent, it doesn't exist um, and it's not likely to. But we can still drive really significant improvement in business and, and government jurisdictions by using imperfect metrics. And for the researchers and um, academic colleagues out there, it'd be great if we could focus our um, research and development on a small set of metrics that we believe are, are fit for business and that they're compatible. They can be scaled up to global um, or national goals at an ecosystem and a species level. So, so that's a quick overview of metrics. I hope that explains why we don't have a single simple metric um, and why we're gonna keep talking about this for some years to come. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Guy, and a, yeah, a heroic effort uh, once uh, we're doing it with somebody else controlling your slides. So uh, thank you so much for uh, persisting with that. Um, and really, um, really great to see some of those real world examples to just drag us all back down to the reality of, of um, working with, with businesses to try and create these measurements and uh, tell a story. So, so really interesting stuff. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll move on to our final speaker now, uh, Natasha Cadenhead. Uh, Natasha has a background in using quantitative modelling to improve outcomes for threatened species. It's currently undertaking a PhD looking at ways to better incorporate biodiversity into everyday decision making in financial institutions. And her talk is titled, We're Not So Different, You and I. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks, Brendan. And thanks, everybody else. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the traditional lands of the Turrbal and Yagura peoples, and that the sovereignty of this land was never ceded. So I'd like to pull back slightly um, for our last short talk and touch on some broader ideas of decision making and approaches for structuring our thinking around business and biodiversity. So in order to use some of the tools and metrics that we've heard about, we need to know how we're actually going to implement those in our decision making, how we're going to integrate them together. And so obviously, everyone here is familiar with making decisions either in your personal life or for many of you in business. But the context of biodiversity in the natural world can be quite different. And so the decisions that you need to make can be quite new. I'm going to discuss some of those differences, but I hope ultimately to convince you that we're actually not that different when it comes to making decisions and that that's a really strong foundation um, for us to build on and work together. So how do we make decisions? Well, humans do it in all sorts of different ways, and I'm not gonna turn this into a TED talk. So the short version is uh, some of the shortcuts that our brains take to make decisions every day are not appropriate for big complex systems like businesses or the natural world. Um, and luckily there's a whole field of research called decision theory that's there to help us structure our thinking a bit more formally for making these complex decisions. And one of the excellent things about decision theory is that it's kind of for everyone. So if you're in the corporate world, the NGO space, academia, government, the foundations of making good decisions are the same. So what you're seeing on the screen here are six different approaches to what I would call and what many people would call structured decision making, but different fields have different names for them. You can see here we've got military, policy, some of you might recognize the plan, do, check, act approach from business. In the middle, we've actually got the um, 
a figure from the paper Prue alluded to earlier, talking about um, a framework for business and biodiversity. So they're all basically the same, right? When you look at these diagrams, they're just, they're tweaked for the different contexts that they're used in. So I'm gonna to touch on three contexts that I think where conservation makes quite different decisions or different types of decisions to business. Um, but as I go, you'll probably recognize uh, approaches that you use in your own contexts, even if they have different names or you use them slightly differently. So the first one is time. In conservation, we're often dealing with very different time scales to those of other fields. The scale on which business decisions are made obviously has a huge amount of variation in itself. You might be making many, many decisions on a daily basis on a trading floor or have sort of decade long timescales for large corporate strategies. But in conservation, we're really talking about millennia of evolution that have brought us to the point of the biodiversity that we have today. We're talking about decades or centuries of ecosystem growth to progress through different successional stages, which you can sort of see on the screen here. And we may value a future state more than we value the present, which is quite different to ideas of a dollar today is worth more than a dollar 20 years from now. And we often deal with large time lags between actions and impact, whether that's consequences we're feeling now from the past or actions that we take now and seeing what their impact are is into the future. So these timescales can be quite hard to conceive of for humans because we're not that good at thinking beyond our lifespan. Although I will note that these things are often well accounted for in traditional ecological, ecological knowledge, which you can see in practices like traditional burning. So we use tools like stochastic dynamic programming, which can help us optimize the sequence of actions or decision steps we might take because that sequence through time can be really important. Management strategy evaluation, which is common in the fishery space, can be used for making decisions about different scenarios that might have really big time lags between actions and recovery. Another way is in the diversity of things that we care about or measure. So in business, the not always, but a lot of the time, the standard unit of measure is dollars. And that doesn't mean that it's, that makes everything more simple. Obviously that has its own complications, but with the increasing focus on triple bottom line, things are starting to change. And this is an area where conservation is really well versed. We're often working with many, many dimensions of things that we care about. We value individual species, sometimes you know, hundreds or thousands of them at the same time. We value processes, the intactness of ecosystems, services that we're getting. It's kind of in the name, right? Biodiversity, we're valuing the diversity. And so that's necessarily along a lot of different dimensions. And we have tools, machine learning tools like principal component analysis, clustering analysis that can help us reduce some of those dimensions to ones that will impact which decisions we make. And then for a certain irreducible amount of dimensions, we have things like multi-criteria decision analysis, which can help us to hold all those different dimensions of interest at the same time while we make decisions. The last thing I'll touch on is uncertainty. And I think this is a space where we have a lot to learn from each other because we both, we all have quite a rich history. So business, particularly finance, obviously has a lot of experience with accounting for uncertainty. And of course, the natural world, chock full of the stuff. So none of us can predict the future, but we all have developed ways of dealing with the fact that we need to still make decisions under uncertainty. I would also argue, based on the slide on your screen, that none of us know how to visually represent uncertainty in a non-cheesy way. That's not a horrible stock image, but in conservation, we frequently use things like scenario analysis and forecasting to systematically assess different potential futures. We can use expert elicitation and sensitivity analyses, which are things that can often help us deal with uncertainty around our data. And we've borrowed things like portfolio theory from economics to help us deal with ideas around spatial conservation planning or restoration of fish stocks. So this is an area that I think 
we all have a lot um, to learn from, which kind of brings me to my final point, which is that we really make decisions built on the same foundations, our context, the structures that we work in, the types of decisions we make, and sometimes the tools are different or similar with different names, but decision theory has always been malleable and multidisciplinary. And so we can use it to borrow from each other and build fit for purpose decision tools that suit this new interdisciplinary sort of area between biodiversity and business. And I'll um, leave it there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Natasha. Um, really great overview and sort of heartening to see that there's a lot of um, a lot of tools out there kind of almost ready for us to uh, to pick up and start to, to utilise. So uh, really excellent to have those insights. Now I'm going to uh, go to uh, our panel members for some responses. Please do keep push pushing your uh, questions into the um, into the Q and A. Um, just going to change tack a little. Um, I'd like to to go uh, first to Sissy, if I might, Sissy, um, to just get a bit of a, a, I guess, a bit of a response from the sort of traditional owner perspective, um, and perhaps giving us a bit of insight into some of those um, real world complexities and challenges for decision making that you come across on a on a on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, and thanks to the, uh, the the presentations. They were very enlightening, and I think I can I've learned a few uh, new skills uh, from watching those presentations. But uh, something of interest is the uh, the decision making processes. Of, as I've said before, is I'm really passionate about getting the voices of Indigenous people and their issues um, around the table, especially when we're talking about conservation and land management, and uh, within this sort of day and age, there's been a it's been a long journey for Aboriginal people along the way um, with having access back to country through the native title process and being in a position to be able to make uh, free prior informed decisions um, on country to look at the importance of conservation and land management, but looking at it also from a traditional ecological perspective and looking at it from a cultural perspective and and also taking into consideration the uh, the Western systems that are put upon our decision making processes. Some of the things that we're working on at the moment was the uh, the right way science approaches. We're trying to roll out in our own organisation, but this is something that Aboriginal people have been passionate about: is bringing the two knowledge together, the Western system and the cultural systems, and looking at those governance structures and decision making through them to be able to complement the work that we need to undertake for a better system for everybody, building a strong um, ecosystem, a strong society of people who understand this, um, the decision-making behind those uh, systems is really important and to be able to have the Western system and the, the indigenous um, uh, views uh, come together to be able to enrich the uh, decision-making process for a better outcome for everybody. Uh, some of the other things that, um, you know, I. I Sort of quite a lot of on Jeremy's um, presentation was the offsets and this is something that's I think I've um, had some questions about also just in regards to you know there has been a huge gap I think in the offsets um, at the moment within Australia and I know with Indigenous people and in looking at the uh, the impacts of um, fire and um, a lot of our groups up in the northern area have been managing um, the land for a very long time right through us you know the nation for 60,000 plus years but being able to get back on country to be able to look at fire management practices and to be able to look at uh, some of the, um, I guess, programs and that are coming through uh, with the carbon abatement project and looking at fire management has brought up some concerns, but also looking at the business and economic development that bigger organisations are taking advantage of these offsets and are they really actually contributing back into the, the broader society and um, looking at the benefits of the biodiversity and I, I mean like I have questions about that as an Aboriginal person but I think on a local scale things are working really well and I think um, you know we can make um, you know we can measure those impacts on a local level and a local scale to be able to use as um, as a uh, mechanism to be able to push um, to more regional levels and probably Projects, um, there are huge gaps in that, and we have to really look at 
specialised skills coming in to be able to measure some of those impacts um, uh, from the fire and uh, looking at monitoring things for the, for the future. Um, but overall, I just think, you know, some of the biggest challenges that Aboriginal people are faced with is um, being taken seriously, um, um, especially when we're talking about conservation, when we're talking about biodiversity. Yes, we do have awesome ranger programs, Indigenous ranger programs, but you look at the system where it's set up at the moment, it's set up under the uh, National and Indigenous um, Agency within the Department um, of Indigenous Affairs. So it's not really looking into, it's not being taken seriously. It doesn't sit under the umbrella of the Department of uh, Environment on the Commonwealth level. Um, it was originally classed as a uh, an employment program. So not taking into consideration the amount of work that Aboriginal Rangers are doing right across the nation and protecting um, a lot of the landscapes and ecosystems um, around. So these are big conversations that really need to happen and to get people on board to be able to push the importance of uh, taking uh, Indigenous ranges and our land protectors and our uh, elders' stories and you know looking at how do we really create a narrative that complements all the work that we're doing. So you can't divide conservation with traditional ecological knowledge. Or, you know, it, when with Aboriginal people are looking at this element, it's looking at it from a holistic approach. How do we make sure we complement some of that stuff? You know, it's about appreciating and valuing the same common goals that we all share is uh, protecting and managing country forever. So this is something I think that all of us, you know, on the online today can really, um, I guess, link to, but associate with um, some of these key messages and, and to be able to, um, you know, create a space for our future. And it's not about cutting down on the development. It's about thinking about the right decisions and making the right decisions for our future. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Sissy. That's, um, that's really great stuff. And uh, so many, it's such a rich uh, narrative there and so many really um, relevant and important things for our discussion. I'm, I'm just going to pick up on one of them. Um, you, you, you bring up this, the challenge of uh, trying to bring in, bring this holistic view of, of, the, of the management of country and nature and people in country. Uh, it's a hugely challenging uh, thing to then put that next to you know systems where we're trying to measure and um and report and and uh and balance the books and do offsets i think there's a a, a huge um divide there or challenge at least to to, to um cross that uh, the sort of in a way different ways of thinking and accounting jeremy i'm going to um put you on the spot here i know you've been doing um a bit of work that's uh, that's probably relevant just just touch on uh in response to some of sissy's comments did you did you want to um have a, a quick response to some of those uh, points thanks brendan uh I, i'll just keep it really brief i think um i i guess um this might be a bit of an indirect response but um Looking at the direction that uh, and the language around the um, the Commonwealth um, framework around biodiversity offsetting specifically, I can see um, there's a lot of aspirational statements about um, the better incorporation of Indigenous values and in practice in biodiversity conservation in a general sense, but in in practices like offsetting particularly, as you know. Um, some of the work that we are doing is, is exploring these issues. Um, I think uh, what's probably really important is um, getting a better uh, and more holistic sense of values, indigenous uh, values and capturing these in these decision-making um, protocols. I think um, work that's being done by the Nature Conservancy sets a good precedent for that uh, through healthy country planning. And so I think um, if, if, if those sorts of uh, uh, activities can be formalised uh, in a really collaborative sense under the legislative framework, I think that would be a step in the right direction. Great. Thanks, uh, Jeremy. Look, I think um, 
that's uh, that's we could spend all of tonight uh, just talking around that <laughs> that particular that particular topic. Um, I'm just going to bring forward a couple of the questions now to the panel, um, if I might. Uh, just bring forward a question that's been partially answered by Hugh, uh, by Prue in the chat. Um, but Prue, um, one of the questions that came up from our audience was, um, how do we quickly distill the sustainability and biodiversity impact frameworks into one consistent framework? And, and will that, you know, how will that occur in, in practice? And is this just going to be the domain of the, the big businesses? So, um, so there you go. There's a, a challenging three-pronged topic for you to uh, sink your teeth yeah. into. Thanks, thanks Brendan. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I, I feel like at the moment um, it's a bit, as Guy, you know, Guy slide with all those, um, those metrics, all the, you know, the, the acronyms that we've now got for a load of metrics. Um, it's a busy space. It's like we're, we're in that innovation phase of lots of ideas coming out and lots of initiatives. And I think we, we will, over the next few years, we have to start to like funnel that in and start to get towards, um, you know, some standardised approaches. And of course, with the International Convention for Biological Diversity, I think this is the right time to actually start to, to, to converge and, and set the direction for, for businesses of all sizes from big corporates, which are a lot of the ones that are working on biodiversity at the moment that, that are reaching out to NGOs, consultants and academics. But there's of course so many SMEs you know, behind them that, that also would like to do the right thing, just don't have the, the big budgets or the, you know, the, the ability to necessarily look into it as deeply as they would like. So there's some initiatives which I mentioned in, the, um, in response to Angela's question uh, that, are, that are coming out at the moment. There's the Natural Capital Coalition's Biodiversity Supplement, which um, I hope will, it's, it's due out in, uh, within the next few months. Um, and that basically, along, along with the natural capital protocol, highlights how biodiversity fits in specifically, because that, that was an area of improvement that they always knew they needed to focus on. So there's that. And then there's also the task force for nature related financial disclosure. And that will be the equivalent to the TCFD for climate disclosure, which, you know, has really helped like funnel businesses in, you know, pointing in the same direction. So I think I think we're starting to see that, but you know, I apologise to everyone that it, it's you know it's that messy innovation space that we're in right now, um, mm. and hopefully you know we can start to work together. Like Guy said, it's now actually about you know starting to join some of those dots and all illustrate. If you're working on something, show how it fits into that bigger picture to actually help businesses place what you're doing and understand whether or not it's relevant to them. Thanks, Prue. That's um, that's really nicely distilled. It is a messy and challenging space, and 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 um, in that um, in the spirit of of uh, joining the dots, uh, Raja, you know, have we got? Are we seeing a convergence of these biodiversity measures and these carbon measures, or is this just this fantastical analogy that we've all been looking for and trying to grasp onto that that's maybe not going to come? not come to fruition sort of are we seeing a convergence of the biodiversity measures and the carbon measures or what's the analogy there is that worth pursuing i actually i think the the first convergence is what Prue was saying because um not not only do we have to have individual companies doing the right thing but we need to actually have capital uh, no longer flowing into activities that create problems, but actually have capital flowing into business activities that are creating net positive outcomes. So I do think that's where disclosure is uh, incredibly important. Um, so that, I mean, you look at Guy's um, graphic, right? He's showing you've got this much capital flowing into kind of an equities portfolio um, and creating negative impact and, and you know, just a huge amount of, um, negative biodiversity impacts. Well, so how do we start to flip that around um, so that you basically say to investors say, well, we're not going to invest in those companies that are creating that, um, you know, we will divest of equities that are creating, you know, negative uh, biodiversity outcomes. And let's start comparing individual players, you know, within, within a sector. Um, I think that, is, that would be a, a huge uh, advancement 
um, forward, if even if we can start to get basic comparisons between players, um, you know, in in the sector, and um, you know, there's some there's some um, conversations now as well about you know how do you uh, when we think about climate uh, the climate benefits and investments that are creating that positive climate benefits, can we start to create some kind of you know um, ratings agency or some kind of way to look at you know biodiversity rich climate benefits versus less biodiversity rich you know climate benefits and and who's going to pay for that um, so I think there is a lot of thinking around uh, all of this and it's clear from the discussion today and I guess from my perspective you know I'm ultimately thinking about how do we get capital uh, flowing into into the those um, those investment opportunities um, and um, and and certainly, uh, if we can strengthen the regulatory framework that creates you know these better offset opportunities, um, I think investors are are interested in that. Even if it is still you know kind of um, some years away uh, before we get there, but I think there is a lot of interest, in, and and I think climate's kind of paving the way to think about these broader opportunities. Great, thank you. And and look, um, I'm sure our panel would love to continue on that topic, but just um, we can't go the whole talk without having a bit of a um, a visceral reflection on offsets. Um, so I'm going to push up a question here that come from the uh, audience. Um, how can we work towards better establishment of threatened species and ecological community targets uh, to better inform offset design? Um, it's common for targets uh, to be focused on outputs rather than explicit outcomes uh, of uh, and impact. So I know that sounds like something that Martine would be able to give us a whole lecture on. I'm gonna start with David uh, from the coalface uh, to give us a bit of a quick reflection on that and then we might throw to Guy, please. May not be going to the coalface on this one, uh, but it's, it's actually something that um, um, I'm quite passionate about. Uh, last year, I uh, helped organise the uh, the National Biodiversity Offsets Conference, um, and this this issue is right. we we often focus on on a process. We look at things like what Guy was suggesting, some of these 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 metrics like uh, the quality. Uh, hectares, there's other things, biocondition, habitat hectares, biodiversity assessment method. They all measure um, process. You're measuring changes in, in quality in vegetation and in, in, in diversity of vegetation and so forth. But often offsets are driven by particular things. Offsetting habitat for the, um, the region honey that Jeremy brought up before, like koalas and so forth. And it's very, very rare to find examples of uh, actual offsets that have actually achieved the purpose of the original offset. We can measure progress towards better habitat, but we can never actually say, well, we've lost one koala in this um, development, but we have successfully got two more um, back in the wild um, as a consequence of this, um, of this development. So, um, this was one of the problems I faced with organising this conference last year. I could not find anyone that was able to speak to that very topic. So there's not a whole lot of research being done in that space. Um, and I feel that it's a, it's a, it, it needs to be done, um, given we've got such a dynamic space uh, in offset policy and framework and so forth. We need to actually measure whether we're being successful in um, uh, what we're trying to achieve. To use an analogy, um, we invest thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in offsets in this country. Um, the um, with financial uh, settlement offsets in Queensland, there's something, there's something like $30 million or more sitting in the bank there um, for uh, delivery of offsets, just by way of example. If those kind of figures were invested in a, um, a health program, and at the end of the day, we weren't finding that um, there was a tangible benefit at the end, people were, weren't, uh, less people were dying at the end of that program, um, rather than we've rolled this out in so many hospitals, um, would be outraged. Uh, so I guess it's called arms. <laughs> we need more uh, research in this space. Um, so I'm not sure if that really answered your question. It sort of just exp uh, agrees <laughs> with the, the, the person who posed that question. It is, yeah. a, it is a difficult thing. We need more uh, focus in this area. 
it would have been disturbing had you been able to answer it in that short time I'm under pressure given that we haven't been able to really answer it over the last 10, 15, 20 years of offsets. So um, look, uh, time runs short on us. Guy, I'm just going to give you a, an opportunity for a, a, a quick final word on, on offsets, if you would. Is there a, is there a better way? Is it, is it a necessary evil? Are we stuck here? Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll have to round out, I'm afraid, because it's uh, nearly six and, well, I'm getting pretty hungry. I don't know about all of you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, it, it, it's clear that offsets are not delivering what they're supposed to. And, and I fear that the, the drivers in the regulatory framework behind offsets has really been captured by the, um, by the developers and the environmentalists and the ecologists uh, are not really getting our, our fair say. Um, one different model that, that we've played with in other countries with less um, prescriptive requirements is, is rather than going through this kind of mathematical tit for tat prescriptive way of determining exactly how to do your offset is to have a much more consensus um, based multi-stakeholder discussion and come up with something that the key stakeholders in particular including um, ecologists and, and um, locally affected people, in particular any indigenous peoples, something that, that they all feel is, is fair and valid. So we're trying to hit multiple targets rather than purely um, numbers of quality hectares. Um, of course, that's, that, that's kind of open to its own abuses, but yeah, that's a different model that I think is worth exploring some places. Thanks very much, Guy. Um, look, we could keep going on this all night. It's a, a, a fabulous um, and fertile ground for conversation. Um, the panel's done a great job. Uh, and so thank you all very much to the presenters and the panel for, for such a top effort. Um, I'm throwing, uh, Heather will throw open the chat now. Uh, so that's just the standard chat at the bottom in the middle of your um, screen there for any final comments that the audience would like to make, please go ahead. Um, just a reminder that our uh, next webinar begins in a few weeks, Lessons from the Fires, a Biodiversity and Climate Perspective. Uh, there will also be a link in the chat to that if you can find it amongst everybody else's comments. Uh, we'll be sending around a resources pack in the coming weeks for everyone who registered um, with more resources on this topic, including answers to some of the questions that we didn't get to today. Um, and we'll also put up a link to uh, provide for you to provide feedback uh, on this seminar to help us improve uh, the way we do these things in this strange time. Um, and so please do go ahead and, and give us your thoughts on that. Thank you everyone for coming. Again, the speakers and the panelists for a, a fascinating and enlightening uh, hour and a half. Um, thanks to the audience for, for coming along. It's been really interesting and um, look forward to uh, seeing you all at our next webinar. Stay safe, everyone, and uh, thanks very much again. Good night. Thank you, everyone.